Hello and welcome to another edition of Astronomy for Everyone. And I mean Astronomy for Everyone. From the littlest people in your family all the way up to the oldest, we want to be inclusive. We want everybody to get excited about what's up in our skies. And that's part of what drives us to make this show. So we hope you have a good time listening to us today. I have the pleasure once again of sitting in the moderator seat. This is where you usually see Don Clasier who sits once again to my left. And that's because Don is the subject matter expert for today's show once again. And today we're going to talk about sky lore mythology. Right. Yeah. Right. For the fall. For the fall. Exactly. Upcoming fall. So Don, why don't you kick us off? Where would you like us to start with this subject? Well, we're going to start off with the uh, constellation of Andromeda. Uh, we bring up a image here, so folk give them an idea of just what it looks like. Uh, this can be found this time of the year uh, up in the eastern sky. It looks like a pair of skinny legs to me. It starts from the bottom right and it kind of sticks up. Or a cor giant cornucopia. A giant cornucopia, that's another idea. Exactly. I never looked at that one. Yeah, it could be grain going in and being held. This is the daughter of King Cepheus and Queen Cassiopeia that we're going to uh, talk about a little bit later. And um, she was the innocent victim of her mother's um, vanity, shall we say. And we'll get into that story a little bit later when she, we talk about that. She's them. chained to the rocks. This is a damsel in distress. Right. And this folk motif of the... Uh, damsel in distress, is really seen across a wide variety of cultures. For example, the Greek story, the story of Perseus and Andromeda. You see Perseus getting ready to uh, slay the beast and uh, Andromeda beside herself there, uh, hoping not to be devoured. Now in Japan, they have a similar story. Uh, an old couple and their beautiful daughter are uh, being threatened by a large serpent. And uh, the serpent is threatening to eat their daughter, okay? But the hero of the story comes along, slays the serpent, and uh, marries the daughter, and they live happily ever after. Now, we also have this same story in medieval Europe uh, with the story of St. George and to the dragon. The dragon. Exactly, right. exactly. And again, we can see the fair damsel in distress in the background. Oh, I like this picture. This is nice color. Look at this beautiful, yeah. right? And there, there's St. George. He's, he's got his spear going right through the monster. Yes, he does. And, and so we can see this theme reoccurring uh, really across time and in, in different cultures. And it's believed that this story actually goes back to Babylon and maybe even earlier. It's mentioned in their epic of creation. So. And we have our damsel in distress in the background of the last image, just sitting in red, looking re ready, grateful. There she is. Yeah. Grateful to be rescued. Um, and so you, you're saying this is a theme that we're seeing not only across time uh, in, in Western cultures, but globally as well. Right. You know, from the Middle East to Japan to medieval Europe. It could even go elsewhere. Maybe going back all the way to Babylon, uh, which might be a progenitor uh, pl story place for the United States, or uh, not for the United States, for the world, global world. Yep. And um, it radiated outwards and is still found everywhere. So that's okay. really, it's really kind of interesting. And then we take those ideas that we find universal to ourselves, and we have a tendency to throw them up into the sky. Yeah, exactly, as we try to make sense of what we see up in the night sky. And uh, of course, our next constellation would be Perseus, the hero that we just took uh -huh. a glance of. There's his uh, constellation. There's his constellation. Right there, yep. Now, he was the son of Zeus uh, with a mortal woman. Uh, there are many stories of that, uh, none of which we can get so into. So he's sort of a half a god, you know? R exactly. Zeus on one side, mortal on the other. Exactly. And, of course, he's famous for slaying the Gorgon Medusa, the woman with the hair of snakes. Ooh. And, uh, well, there we can see Perseus right there in a, uh, 
Renaissance statue uh, being displayed there. Um, Looks like he generally did a good thing there by knocking her head off her shoulder. Right. Yeah. And, of course, he had to be careful because if you gazed upon her face, you would turn to stone. So he had to be very careful to do that. Now, the Greeks weren't the only ones to have this story. The Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, had the story of Chem, another hero, and even the Persians had Mithras. So again, this great hero that comes along we see in other cultures as well. And the, the hero's job is always to have this sort of a, a mysterious origin, half god perhaps in some way, and then with those powers goes out and slays the dragon, kills the, kills the evil that needs to be killed in order to... Showing up in the nick of time. Showing up in the nick of time. Exactly, and, exactly. And the, the damsel in distress is not just the damsel, it represents the society as a whole. Exactly. It's been rescued. Exactly, okay. exactly. So then we move to Pegasus. The flying horse. Right, and also known as the Great Square. We'll get to that in just a, a few minutes. Now, Pegasus is uh, best known from the Greek story of Bellerophon, that he, he rode Pegasus as he battled the monster Chimera. And, of course, it didn't turn out well for Bellerophon. He, he fell to earth. But uh, how did Pegasus fare? Well, Pegasus, after that, flew to Mount Olympus, and uh, he became the favorite steed of, uh, of Zeus, or Jupiter. And uh, he would actually bring, he, Pegasus, would bring the lightning bolts to Zeus that he would throw. He was the carrier of the lightning bolts. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. And here, he's upside down. Does he ever get upside uh, right side up for us? No. No, here in the, the northern hemisphere. He's always hemisphere, going to be upside down. He's always, yep, upside down. And, uh, and maybe if you're in Argentina and you get to see him, then... Right, right side up, just right like they see up. Orion upside down. They would see him upside down. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So you got to give a little, take a little. Our, our Pegasus is upside down, but at least now I can see a little better where his legs go. And he said the great square of Pegasus. That's, that's, that's his body. That's mm -hmm. his body, and you can see the lines that are supposed to be his head. That, that all looks a little bit more, you know, believable to me, a little more tangible. Now, they include Pegasus with this story of Perseus and Andromeda. He's sometimes shown, you know, riding Pegasus to dispatch with Cetus, the sea monster. But in fact, Perseus actually had a pair of winged sandals that he was given by Mercury to help him in his task. And of course, the shield that he had, he received from Minerva. So we're not quite sure how Pegasus fit into the Perseus and Andromeda story, but there he is. A little bit of overlap in the cultural stories, perhaps. I, I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm thinking. He, it might have been a bit overloaded to be riding a horse with tremendous wings that could carry lightning bolts, and you've got sandals that fly and a special shield from Minerva. Exactly. Uh, that's top-heavy with good stuff. Oh, it is. It okay. is. All right. Now, there's a little interesting aspect with the Great Square and Andromeda. And uh, here we can see the two of them together. And sometimes this is called the Third Dipper. Okay, so what you need to do is just use the lower line of stars, from Alpharats to Mirfach, to Almach, okay, those, and there's a fourth star in there too. Those are the four brightest. So, so it's you're working from from the square out, out outward, okay. Only the lower line. So, and if you tilt your head to the left, just a little bit, it looks just like another dipper. I can see that. Yeah, a little something interesting I stumbled across uh, in my research. I hadn't really ever thought about it before, but it kind of does. You could, yeah. you could almost use either one of those legs as the handle for the dipper. You could. Yeah, but the lower one has the four brightest stars. Has the so four that, brightest stars. So that's a little bit, little bit easier yeah. to see. Yeah, that would be the one to go for. Okay. So, up to that. Next, Cepheus and Cassiopeia, the parents of Andromeda. Uh, and this is where... The story starts. Now, they're in the northern sky, and when we did the northern sky back in the spring show, I didn't cover them because I wanted to save them for now. So, here's the story. Cassiopeia, the queen, 
was very vain. She thought she was the most beautiful woman in all the world. And we can see why she's staring at herself in a mirror. She proclaimed herself to be the most beautiful woman. And this angered the sea nymphs of the sea god Neptune. Now, he got angry and he says, well, we have to right this wrong. No one, especially a mortal, can be more beautiful than my sea nymphs. So Neptune's sending a monster to ravage the coast of the kingdom. Well, the king, Cepheus, is a good king, so he wants to protect his country. So he goes to the oracle and says, what do I need to do to save my country? The oracle tells him, sacrifice your daughter and your kingdom will be spared. Goes back, chains his daughter to a rock, as we see here in this image. Sea monster comes along. Just in the nick of time, so does Perseus. As always. Now, the head of the Medusa he has in a sack that he carries on his belt. He pulls out the head. Cetus looks at it, turns to stone, and immediately sinks to the bottom of the sea. He rescues the fair damsel in distress, and they get married, and they live happily ever after. And uh, Useful to have a head of a gorgon in your knapsack there, isn't You it? just never know. You never know when you, you can need to pull one out and turn somebody to stone or some monster. Exactly. Now, the thing is, punishment still has to be meted out because obviously Andromeda wasn't eaten. So to uh, get the uh, punishment that Neptune wants, Cassiopeia is placed in her chair and every 12 out of every 24 hours, she spends upside down. And you know, I've watched that when I've been outside doing astronomy. I mean, here, I really don't see the queen so much, but I do see the chair easily. It looks like a W to me. Exactly. When I look at the sky, I, people say, well, where's Cassiopeia? I say, you see that W up there? Well, that's her throne. Imagine her sitting on that. And then it's a circumpolar right. constellation. So it swings around the North Star, but it doesn't get low enough to the horizon to yep. ever go away. Exactly. And so her punishment is to be right set up and beautiful half the time and upside, upside down, down and maybe a little less beautiful, a little more distressed the second half of the evening. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, that and was, justice is served. Justice was served. Exactly. With ketchup. Okay. All right, our final constellation. Bring it on. Capricornus, the sea goat. Sea goat? A sea goat, yeah. There's the constellation, what and it looks pretty good. Yep. But this is a really strange story. It's a half goat and half fish. The Greek story is the monster Typhon chasing the god Pan, who has a goat body. Pan jumps into the water to escape and hopefully change his appearance but only half of them goes underneath. So the, his bottom half is a fish, his upper half stays a goat. And uh, this goes back to, to Babylon and maybe even to prehistory. And Capricorn is also one of the three rainy season constellations from the Middle East along with Aquarius and with oh, that's, Pisces. That's another nice picture, okay. Now, Mo mostly goat on the right, a little bit fishy looking on the left. And exactly, and this, really exemplifies for the Chinese what they call the Mo Qi, the goat fish. So this is Chinese culture now we're looking at. Mm -hmm. As a, and we just took the jump from Greco-Roman over to Chinese. Exactly, and, exactly. And we see that the story is repeating itself once again, not only just over different cultures, but over different periods of time. And you get the same ideas just coming up and coming up and coming up. And, and so we throw it up into the air and they become our constellations. Exactly. And so that's our look at the, the constellations for our fall season. I, I think that wraps us up for the first half of this show. We're going to take a brief break and hear Steve Witte and his term of the month. And then we'll be right back to pick up where we left off with the second half. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Tim. The term of the month is M45, the Pleiades. The Pleiades is an open cluster. Uh, it's a gorgeous open cluster. Uh, nebulosity may be visible in a very large telescope, 
uh, but usually you just see the stars. People call it the seven sisters, although naked eye, people argue about how many they can see, anywhere from six to like 11. Um, it's, the stars are fairly young stars. They're about 100 million years old. And the cluster is expected to stay hang and hang together for a, another 250 million years. In this second image, we have the moon, and directly above it is where the Pleiades is. It's close to the ecliptic, a line that connects the moon, uh, Uranus, and Neptune. The planets follow this line, they're not, and they frequently visit it, the Pleiades. Term of the month, the Pleiades. Yes, I'm ready. Welcome back to the second half of our Astronomy for Everyone episode in which we continue to explore the folklore of the uh, fall skies and what it all means and has meant to the different peoples over the ages as they've looked up and said, what's up there? So uh, Don, why don't you continue to take us through this walk through the, the sky and in particular um, the Milky Way which is just, it's, it's astounding to see if you ever get to a dark sky site. And that's the key. Yeah. yeah. From, from a large city anywhere in the world, forget about it. Yeah. So, so in the midst of like downtown Detroit, where we are now, that's a tough thing to see. You, you won't see it. You won't even see it at Not all. all. Not at all. Okay. No. So don't, don't be disappointed if you go outside and you look up and you go, Milky Way, what Milky Way? You've got to go someplace dark. Exactly. Okay. And really, the Milky Way has had uh, a fanciful and descriptive names in every age. But one of the reoccurring themes that we see really across the world is a river of heaven or a pathway or a road to heaven. That okay. seems to be almost universal. And uh, for the Greeks... They really had two different type of stories. Uh, the first story was uh, the Milky Way was really the spilled milk from uh, the goddess Hera as she nursed Hercules. As he was pulled away, the milk spilled across the sky, and that explains for them the Milky Way. Now, they also had a more scientific approach, and they saw the Milky Way as one of the heavenly circles surrounding the Earth, along with the equator, the tropics of Capricorn, and also the meridian and the ecliptic. So these great heavenly circles and the Milky Way was, was one, one of, of them. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, as we continue on through the mythology, for example, the Babylonians saw it as a serpent. And uh, they also had a secondary story where this pathway of light through the sky was really a trail of grain that was dropped by a thief as he was running away. Interesting take. So that's Babylonian. That's taken us way back into history. Right. 4,000 years, maybe more It than could that. go even farther. 5,000 years. Prehistory. Prehistory. Okay. Yeah. Pre yeah it's really kind of uh, okay. hard to tell. Right. Now in China, they call it the Heavenly River. And it's also known as that in Japan as well. So they see it as water as opposed to a trail of grain right. or a stream of milk. Exactly. Okay, exactly. for them it's water. It's a river. The river, heavenly river leading to the great beyond. Now, for the Vikings, okay, this gets interesting. They saw it as the path of the ghosts. Really? Like warriors who were killed in battle. Right. Okay, this was Wotan's way, their head god, and warriors could only enter Valhalla if they died in battle. And then they would ascend via the Milky Way to Valhalla. This was the stairway to heaven. The stairway to heaven, literally. Yes. You, uh... So they would look at it anticipating that one day I will walk that path. Knowing that they, their goal if they, to die would be to die in if battle. If they died in battle. In battle. If they had a glorious ending. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, it's interesting that the Native American cultures, uh, for example, the Algonquins that lived in the Great Lakes area, they also saw it as the pathway to the hereafter for vanquished warriors. 
but they added a little bit of a twist. There's a lot of bright stars, as you can see in the image, that lie along That's the path. That's a beautiful image, yes. And for them, and those so bright stars represented the campfires of those departed warriors. Oh. Yeah. So a little I, bit... Uh, that's an eloquent idea. It's a yeah, beautiful idea. It, it does, you know, kind of resemble that. The closer in stars, the, the you know, some of the 6,000 that we can actually see as stars. And, uh, of course, the rest of them are just the rest of our galaxy. The, so there are 6,000 stars that are part of the Milky Way? That are close enough to us so that we can see them as individual stars. Okay. The other 300 billion are... Uh, just that soft glow or pathway in the sky. Now the last culture I want to cover are the Egyptians. And the Egyptians saw the Milky Way as the goddess Newt. And we see her pictured here below with a picture of the Milky Way up above. Newt is the one with the blue. The blue the with the stars on her, her body. The goddess okay. of the sky. And then the Milky Way imitates her shape of, in the picture above. Exactly. All right. And, and so she's the goddess Newt. And then underneath her, there's, there's a gentleman lying down on the ground there, uh, almost, you know, touching her foot with his foot and, and reaching out to, to touch her hand. Who is this fella? That's her husband, Jeb. And he is the god of the earth. So this culture reversed the earth and the, and the sky sort of Exactly. Thing. Usually it's earth, mother, father, sky. Right. But for the Egyptians in this case, Newt was the goddess of the sky. Oh. She would swallow the sun. That's why it would disappear and then reemerge again the next day. And uh, we can also see her image in the temple of Dendera on the ceiling, which is... Uh, there for folks to see as well. If we could go back to one of the other pictures of the Milky Way uh, for a second, like that one, that's beautiful. Tell us what is it that we're literally looking at that gives this part of the sky, if you get to a dark sky site, the appearance that it has. What? Why does it it's look that It's just that, that collected, accumulated light from the 300 billion stars, more or less, that make up our galaxy, and they're just too far away to see as individual stars. So, I, and, and is it because we're looking at a particular direction in our galaxy? Well, we're looking through the plane of our galaxy. Okay. It's a flat disk, and so that's where the greatest concentration is. The central bulge is in the direction of the uh, constellation Sagittarius. So if I'm imagining our universe as a, 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 fr a fried omelet sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, sunny side down, um, and I'm looking at the, um, uh, the Milky Way, that's me looking towards the center of our own galaxy. Exactly. There we go. The, the central energy, bulge. The, mm -hmm. and, and the central bulge is where most of the matter is, most of the stars yes, are kept in that sort of stuff. That's terrific. Um, I want to really thank you for taking us on the tour today. This has really been an interesting material. Uh, I'm glad I hope you enjoyed that our it. audience enjoyed it uh, as well. Um, we will want to close with a, a, a mention that the website will appear on the screen. There it is for people who are interested in learning more about the club and what we do for here at Astronomy for Everyone. And uh, they are welcome to write in at the email address that was given earlier as well. We love to hear from people. We want interaction. We want you to be, you know, a part of who we are and what we're doing here. And so on that note, I'll bring it to an end and say thank you one more time for enlightening us for right. uh, uh, all of the stories and the just the fact that the, these ideas transcend the entire human race. Right. But they shouldn't go away because they still got to watch Steve with what's up in the night sky. And they do indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. What's up in the night sky for September 2018? The sun rises.
from 7 to 7.30 a.m. and sets from 8 to 7.15 p.m. over the course of the month. Astronomical night is plus or minus an hour and 45 at the beginning of the month and plus or minus an hour and 30 at the end of the month. Of course, the days are getting slower. In fact, we have the autumn equinox on the 22nd of September, so days are sort of half the, you know, half day and half night. The moon starts in third quarter on September 2nd. It's new on the 9th, it's first quarter on the 16th, and full on the 24th. Mercury goes from Leo to Virgo over the month, rises at 5.30 at the beginning of the month, and sets at 7.30 at the end of the month. It's best at the beginning of the month. But this rising and setting uh, over the course of the month has to do with the superior conjunction, which is on the 20th. Uh, in the upper left, you see Mercury, the Sun, and the Earth, more or less, in a straight line, almost horizontal. Uh, and, um, and, it, and Mercury is moving very quickly because it was at perihelion closest to the Sun and therefore moving fastest on the second. Uranus is in Aries, rises 10 p.m. to 8 p.m. over the month, is best at the beginning of the month, is 3.7 uh, arc seconds. Uh, it is magnitude 5.7 and therefore potential, uh, potentially a very good naked eye object. It's pretty faint but I've done it. It is in opposition in October. Um, so Neptune is in Aquarius where it always is, rises 820 to 620 over the month. It is magnitude 7.8, which makes it um, minimally a binocular object. Uh, it is in opposition on September 7th. Uh, it is way too small to see, um, uh, uh, but you can resolve it in a fairly decent sized backyard telescope. Mars is in Capricornus, sets from 3.15 to 2 a.m., is best at the beginning of the month. It is 20 arc seconds, much bigger than the other objects that I've talked about. Uh, but uh, there's a dust storm, a uh, global dust storm on Mars at the moment, and you may not see the um, features that you might uh, on, on a map of Mars. Pluto is in Sagittarius, sets uh, 2.45 to uh, a.m. to 12.51 a.m. Uh, it is best at the beginning of the month. It's high, highest in the sky at 11 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., making this a pretty decent month to look for Pluto. Magnitude 14.2, use at least a 10-inch telescope. Saturn, Saturn uh, is in Sagittarius, sets 11.30 to 11, uh, 1.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m., uh, highest, 9 to 7, it's best at first dark. Jupiter is in Libra, is also best at first dark nearby. Vir uh, Venus is in Virgo, sets 9.30 to 8 p.m., best at the beginning of the month. And that is what's up in the night sky for September 2018. We don't charge anything for astronomy for everyone, but we may tax your brain. There is no quiz, nor is there uh, any sort of audit.